All right, as we begin our next uh, Talk About Doubts Q&A panel discussion, we're going to begin by allowing our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, and we will start with Dr. McClatchy. Sure. So I'm Jonathan. I, I work as, as an assistant professor of biology at uh, Christian Liberal Arts School in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, namely Sattler College, and I teach a number of uh, different courses, uh, freshman biology, genetics and genomics, bioethics, anatomy and physiology, microbiology, and uh, I'm also a fellow of the Discovery Institute, Center for Science and Culture, and so I do a lot of work and research on intelligent design. Uh, I'm, I also um, i am very interested in New Testament scholarship and the evidence for the resurrection and things like that. And uh, yeah, I found to talk about doubts.com uh, back in December of 2021. And uh, yeah, this is my my heart and passion. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Jonathan. And for those who are interested, you can uh, learn more about Jonathan at his website, jonathanmcclatchy.com, or you can follow him on YouTube at Jonathan McClatchy. And now we'll ask Vladimir to introduce himself. Well, I'm Vlad. I come from Montenegro. I'm currently studying applied computing at the University of Montenegro. And my primary fields of interest when it comes to uh, Christian apologetics are the defense of historical Christian theology, uh, mainly in terms of Trinitarianism and um, uh, the general uh, traditions of the Christian church. Um, I currently work at the embassy of the UAE uh, in Podgorica, and um, I've been a friend of Jonathan for a long time. We've produced a lot of content together, and I hope we can help some people out tonight as well. All right. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, at this time, we'll turn it over to Eric. Oh, sure. Um, Eric Manning, and I uh, run the uh, YouTube channel Testify, um, which has been going for about a couple of years. Uh, the channel mostly focuses on um, historical apologetics, uh, reliability of the Gospels, um, the resurrection of Jesus, argument from miracles. Um, I do like some responses to other popular atheist YouTubers and answering, you know, some of their skeptical objections. And uh, yeah, other than that, I uh, I'm a father of five, uh, and so that definitely keeps me busy um, when I'm not doing that. So, all right, thanks, Eric. And Eric, of course, mentioned uh, his YouTube channel, Testify Apologetics. I really mm -hmm. encourage you to check that out. And, and by the way, I, I failed to mention uh, Vlad's apologetics as well. You can find him on YouTube uh, at uh, Vlad Apologist. So I would encourage you to check. There's some excellent debates on there with our Muslim friends. So I would encourage you to check those out. Uh, but we'll begin our Q and A time. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll go to Dr. McClatchy first. This question was directed to you. Um, before a person commits to Christianity, what basic things must they affirm to be true? Uh, this question reminded me of Dr. Albert Muller's popularization of theological triage. Uh, what are those things of first importance or greatest importance that one must affirm in the Christian faith? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think obviously the existence of God is is pretty fundamental, uh, and also the the case for the the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus, of course, bears on the existence of God, uh, provides evidence in its own right uh, for God's existence. So I think that uh, if we can have confidence in the robust reliability of the Gospels and Acts, uh, and uh, and uh, the case for the resurrection, uh, I think that provides a very strong justification uh, for Christian belief. Uh, so obviously we have to uh, believe in um, some of the core essentials of the faith, um, the resurrection, uh, and also the deity of Christ, the Trinity, that sort of thing, uh, in order to be Christians, and, and basically understand the uh, the essence of the gospel, which is um, salvation uh, by grace through faith uh, in, in Christ's uh, completed work. Uh, uh, on the cross so that's i think um, essentially the the minimum that would need the one we need to assent to in order to be a christian i would say though that um uh lest i be misunderstood that um i don't think someone necessarily needs to fully understand all of these um doctrines in order to be a justified a rationally justified christian so i don't think that one necessarily needs to fully understand or comprehend the doctrine of the trinity in order to be a rationally justified christian um so, uh, um, and and one 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 can be a, one can be a, an Orthodox Christian and and not fully com comprehend some of these doctrines, uh, even relating to soteriology and, and things like that as well. So, uh, anyone have anything to add there? Uh, 
Not really. Um, I would just include that I think the, the bodily resurrection is something that um, we definitely want to affirm, and I want to emphasize bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's kind of recently just come up in my area of interest uh, on YouTube was um, a, on the Apologia's channel was uh, Dale Allison, who's a noted biblical scholar, um, and he he took offense that some of us um, like. Dr. McClatchy or Dr. Liddy McGrove said, oh, well, we're not, we don't really consider him a Christian, but he is very much kind of obfuscates what resurrection it is. And he, he seems to be pretty disgusted and kind of finds the whole idea of bodily re resurrection as detestable as found in like quotes in his own book. You know, he talks about the idea of, you know, Jesus having, um, digestive system and kidneys and genitals and different things like that in the resurrection and so i think people have accused us of like gatekeeping um but bodily resurrection is something that has been affirmed since paul um in first corinthians 15 is something that is a requirement for salvation on down and so um maybe i'm just touching on that because it's fresh in my mind because it's just something that happened over the last couple of days but um i think we have to draw a line there because I've had some Christians accuse me like, well, you're just gatekeeping. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> on this issue. Yes. We need to gatekeep. Um, orthodoxy is important. Um, and so, yes, you need to affirm bodily resurrection. You need to affirm the incarnation and the deity of Christ. You know, you need to affirm the Trinity um, and those kind of things. You need to understand that Christ's death provides atonement and that he's coming again. Um, and that, you know, if we have to have some standards you can't just throw the gatekeeping word around um because anybody who just wants to call themselves a christian can call themselves a, a christian at that point and not have any christian beliefs so Vlad, do you have anything to to add oh the only thing i would have added uh, but Eric mentioned it right now, is that very idea that we, we have to understand that um, Christ provides atonement and that we are sinful beings. And so, yes, we, we should assent to all the doctrines that uh, Jonathan and Eric mentioned, but also uh, not necessarily have any sort of an in-depth understanding, but simply acknowledge uh, that man is sinful and that uh, Christ is the one who provides salvation through his, through his work. Um, and that is usually in a very basic gospel presentation. So I'm sure anybody who would be interested in Christianity would um, attempt to understand that. Great, great, excellent answers. Uh, our, our next question, moving along quickly, is uh, directed to Eric. Uh, Eric, what do you think of the case for the traditional authorship of the gospels specifically? What do you think about the testimony of the early church fathers? regarding traditional authorship of the four gospels sure i mean i think the uh the case is quite strong and i think it's compelling um i mean we have at the you know all the way from papias who who mentions um matthew mark and john i know there's a little bit of dispute about papias and i'm happy to discuss that you know there's people want to discredit him as like well he didn't really know what he was talking about because of something eusebius said but that has something to do with his eschatology and nothing to do with his actual knowledge of who, who wrote the gospels um a lot of people just want to say well Irenaeus just kind of plucked these names out of thin air it's not exactly what they say i'm kind of oversimplifying of course um but the fact is, is that it was geographically diverse uh, attestation from not just Irenaeus, but Clement of Alexandria, uh, Tertullian. Um, you have the Muratorian fragment, which mentions uh, some of the authors of the Gospels. Um, you also have the fact that Justin Martyr does mention, while he doesn't name the evangelists, he does mention that the four Gospels are memoirs of the apostles. Uh, and then he had a student named Tatian who wrote the Diatessaron, which is basically an attempt to harmonize the Gospels, but he's clearly harmonizing our four Gospels. Um, and then you also have um, the the many, many quotes um, from church fathers even preceding um, the, you know, Irenaeus and different things like that. And they're citing these books as authoritative and as if people should know that like, hey, these are things that we've accepted. Um, and so one thing that I com commonly hear, it's kind of a complaint was, well, they don't mention the authors. Well, we want to kind of be careful that we're not making an argument from silence there. Again, they're 
citing these sources as if people, they expect them to know them and that they do come from Jesus. Um, I think it's, it's not an argument for necessarily traditional authorship, but I think it is some evidence in its favor. And so you take the accumulation of all of these different things, and plus there are internal, I think, pieces of evidence uh, that point to traditional authorship as well. Um, and I think when you combine those things, I, I think we have a uh, pretty strong case. Again, maybe it's not, people can argue against it, but at that point, I think they're applying a double standard because how do we know that other ancient works are attributed to the authors that we have attributed to them, but an unbroken chain of testimony, as as uh, Augustine said um, when he was the four um, authorship of the four gospels was finally questioned, you know, as far as we have in record, you know, many centuries after the fact, and so um, I think Augustine's point is a good one. Jonathan, I know you've talked a lot about um, gospel authorship. Anything you'd like to add to that? I think you're muted, Jonathan. Yeah, I think you're I, muted, Jonathan. sorry. No, I, I completely agree with what Eric said. Uh, I, when it comes to evaluating any other ancient work, uh, we take seriously uh, external testimony as to its authorship. Uh, Clement of Rome doesn't uh, is technically anonymous, right? Um, it doesn't give the name in the text, but we know that Clement wrote it because Irenaeus uh, in the second century tells us that Clement wrote it. He describes a letter that matches or resembles what we have in First Clement, and so and he attributes that to Clement, and so that's how we we determine that Clement of Rome is the probable author of First Clement. Um, there's a common argument that you see um, very commonly in uh, New Testament. Uh, scholarship, which is that the uh, the the gospels are are technically or formally anonymous, uh, which they are. Uh, that is uh, that is true. but uh, but but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the name wasn't on the manuscript. To say that a document is anonymous simply means that the name is not given in the actual text itself. And um, I mean, Luke was writ writing to an official by the name of Theophilus, and uh, presumably Theophilus knew who who was addressing him, right? And uh, I would argue also that uh, John um, uh, uh, John actually does claim to be an eyewitness. And I would argue that, um, and he actually identifies himself as, as the beloved disciple. So he identifies himself as at least a disciple. And I think by a process of elimination, we can infer that John the son of Zebedee is the most likely candidate. Um, the... Um, the, the, the epistle of 1 John uh, is unanimously agreed upon to be composed by the same author as wrote the fourth gospel, uh, whether or not it was that was John, uh, John, son of Zebedee, that's a separate issue. But nonetheless, most scholars agree uh, for very good reason that 1 John and, and John's gospel are written by the same individual. Now, in the prologue of 1 John, in the first four verses, we read, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, Concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and is made and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And so, um, this seems to be quite explicit, uh, an explicit claim to being an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry. And notice that he distinguishes. Um, us from you. Um, in other words, he's not just talking about um, some like generic humanity has witnessed uh, Christ and and um, and and uh, and, hand, and touched with the, with their hands and so forth. Rather, he's speaking specifically about his own experience. So he says, which we looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father. Um, and this is consistent with what he says also in in um, the uh, towards the end of John 21, where he says uh, in verse, verse 24, this is the disciple, speaking about the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, a common objection that sometimes comes up here is that uh, the author seems to be distinguishing himself from the beloved disciple. And so by Ehrman, for example, argues that uh, actually John is here denying being the beloved disciple. But I think this is quite plausibly understood as being very similar to what 
uh, we see in Romans 16.22, where Paul's scribe Tertius interjects um, in Paul's letter, saying, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Um, so I think this is quite plausibly um, a scribal statement um, as to the, the author of, of the fourth gospel. And that's also consistent with some of the internal evidence uh, that suggests that uh, John is the is the most uh, likely author. Um, the, whoever wrote the gospel is an individual who is very well informed. Uh, he's very close up to the facts, and he's in the habit of being truthful. Um, and um, he he's very um, he, he certainly um, he was certainly a very Jewish. who's steeped in Judaism. Uh, he is. Um, you can there's clues in his greek that he is thinking in aramaic even though he's writing in greek uh he so he he, he there's there's tremendous evidence he was a native of palestine so he gives us a, a um um a very accurate portrait of um the uh, um distinct role of the hierarchical class um the the sadducees and um, though he never calls them by their name, played in the religious life and the legal deliberations of Judaism. And he shows incredible uh, accuracy and precision when it comes to uh, his knowledge of places and topography uh, throughout uh, the Gospel of John. He, um, he, he um, shows, he, um, he shows, he has great um, eye for detail. He, there's some very specific details that we can corroborate and confirm uh, that, again, suggests that whoever wrote the fourth gospel is, is an eyewitness. Um, and uh, he he's the one who specifically mentions in John um, uh, John 18, when describing uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane at his arrest, he is the only gospel that gives us the name of the um, of the high priest's servant whose ear Peter cut off, whose name was Malchus. And uh, we learn later in that chapter that uh, that the um, the disciple who'd followed alongside Peter um, in the Garden of Gethsemane was known to the high priest, which is why he's allowed to enter through the door into the into the high priest's garden, and whereas Peter stands outside. And uh, and then later on, we discover that the disciple whom who had been following along with Peter is the beloved disciple, um, who we have reason uh, who, who's the same individual that uh, claims to have written the fourth gospel. And then the the authorship of Luke, I think, is also pretty well established because Luke, um, the the author of Luke Acts, is clearly a traveling companion of Paul, and there's overwhelming evidence for that. Various internal um, corroboration operations, uh, undesigned coincidences with uh, Paul's letters, for example, um, there's extra biblical corroborations, um, numerous um, extra biblical corroborations of Acts. Colin Hemer has a great book on this called The Book of Acts and the Setting of Hellenistic History. And uh, that suggests that the author is indeed a traveling companion of Paul. And by process of elimination, I'd, I'd also argue that Luke is the best candidate, which also happens to correspond with the early church attestation. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. One thing I'd add real quick, um, going back to them being like technically anonymous because they don't name themselves in the document. Well, um, we have literally dozens and dozens of writings um, on the 150 years before Jesus and the 150 years after Jesus, um, where the writers of those particular books aren't naming themselves. Uh, Caesar's commentary on the Civil War is not only written formally anonymous, uh, but it's also written in the third person, not unlike what we see in the Gospel of John, or um, perhaps you could also say that about Matthew as well. Uh, Plutarch, which, if, you know, he's a very important ancient biographer. Uh, he wrote 60 biographies, of which 40 have survived. He never is mentioned once in the writings. And so this, like, well, they're technically anonymous thing is, is, kind, of a, is kind of silly. It just shows an ignorance of um, sometimes when you hear it, because it just shows an ignorance of ancient history. And the Gospels that we do have that aren't anonymous um, are all forgeries where they're adding apostles' names in order to give them more authority and more credit. Um, but we know from looking at those documents that they don't have the kind of uh, historical uh, features that, like, say, the Book of Acts has or the Book of John has, where it can be corroborated with actual real history, real people, real places, uh, undesigned coincidences and different things like that. Um, and so yeah, uh, I that's another thing to definitely kind of keep into consideration when somebody brings something like that up. It's like, well, how well do you know about ancient writing? And we're we're also going to be covering the authorship of the four gospels in this week's uh, teaching course on Thursday at uh, nine p.m. Eastern time. So tune in for that if you want a more detailed discussion of the subject. Vlad, is there anything you'd like to add? 
perhaps just two very, very brief things uh, in regards to the authorship of the Gospels. One would be, um, if you look at the early history within the church, uh, there seems to be very little, if not at all, um, of misattribution or proposing different authors for these Gospels. Um, if you look at some things like the letters of Peter, for example, or rather those of John, you might have suggestions of different authors, whereas with the Gospels, uh, in a very wide geographic area spanning from essentially modern-day Portugal to India, there doesn't seem to be any fathers or figures speaking of a different authorship. And this is perhaps enhanced by another thing I would mention, which is the fact that um, uh, two of the Gospels, those of, of uh, Luke and Mark, aren't written by the highest people you could think of attributing authorship to, uh, namely the Apostles of Christ. And so, um, Given such a fact, it seems unlikely that these uh, attributions would be in some way forged um, because we would expect both the closest people to Christ to be the authors of such writings on one hand, and on the other, for there to be a certain kind of uh, conflict within attribution. So those are just two supporting pieces of evidence we might name. Anyone else follow up? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, Hebrews um, is one that was definitely highly contested. You know, right. people attributed it to Paul, Luke, Barnabas, Clement of Rome. Um, we we see that, um, like Vlad said, we we definitely don't see that with the Gospels. Right. And note, notice also there's a wide geographical spread of attestation, right, in the second century. So you've got Irenaeus in Lyon in France. You've got Tertullian in Carthage in North Africa, uh, Clement in Alexandria in Egypt, uh, Papias of Hierapolis in Asia Minor. So you've got this wide geographical spread. It's also interesting to note that um, Justin Martyr I mean, his, uh, in his uh, first apology, he dis he talks about the uh, the so-called memoirs of the apostles um and he um he also in in the um in the dialogue with trifo he mentions that he mentions the memoirs of peter and he mentions two episodes that happen in the memoirs of peter one is that simon is is called peter and it uh james and john are called zo um, zoanergies by jesus um meaning uh sons of thunder Sorry, Boanerges by Jesus, meaning sons of thunder. And um, what's interesting is that, that neither of those occurs in the extant fragment we have of the so-called Gospel of Peter, but both are in Mark. And the sons of Zebedee incident is only in Mark. And so that suggests that he's talking about the Gospel mm -hmm. of Mark, even though he's calling it the memoirs of Peter. And then if you look at the later church fathers, um, like uh, Irenaeus and Clement and Tertullian, they uniformly refer to the Gospel of Mark as Mark's gospel that drew upon the eyewitness testimony of the of the apostle Peter, and so that's interesting because, um, why would you go from being the memoirs of Peter to the gospel of Mark unless the early church really had good reason to think that Mark was the was the true author because Peter is a far more reputable character than Mark. Mark is best known for having abandoned Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip in Pamphylia, and that results in a split between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15. So that seems like an unlikely attribution. If you look at the apocryphal gospels, they habitually associate those gospels with high profile characters like Peter and, and Thomas and, and so forth. Any other comments? If, if not, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to jump ahead uh, to Eric's next question, uh, which I think goes along uh, very well with the conversation that you're having right now, and um, it's this. The pastoral epistles hmm. seem to be a target of skeptics who claim they were not written by the Apostle Paul. What evidences do you see for Pauline authorship of the pastoral epistles? And I, I jumped ahead a little bit because I think that goes along really well with the conversation that uh, that you're having right now. Sure. Um, I think the the evidence for the pastorals um, being written by Paul is pretty strong and the arguments against it are really weak. Um, I recently did a video uh, responding to a, a biblical scholar um, who's kind of like the resident TikTok Bible scholar, Dan McClellan, um, where he talks about the reason why scholars reject the pastoral epistles. 
Uh, and I found those arguments to be quite weak. And so people are definitely welcome to check that out. Um, but there are a number of um, reasons that I think we can believe that Paul um, actually wrote them. Uh, for example, uh, Clement, or excuse me, not Clement, uh, Polycarp uh, quotes uh, 1 Timothy 3.8, 6.7, uh, 6.10, uh, 2 Timothy 2.12. Um, he's writing uh, in the early second century. Um, and so Paul's name is also mentioned four times in that letter, including some indications that he was familiar with Paul's martyrdom. So I find that to be suggestive, um, even if you don't want to say that's necessarily like a, a knockdown argument by itself. Obviously, there's other attribution, um, like uh, Tertullian mentions that Paul wrote them, Clement of Alexandria, Origen. Um, the argument that Dan brought up was uh, Marcion <laughs> doesn't include them. Well, I mean, Marcion's a known heretic um, who doesn't like the Jewishness <laughs> of of some of the other gospels. And so, well, in Second Timothy, Paul refers to uh, the scriptures, uh, Timothy being raised as a child in the scriptures as like a Jewish boy. Um, and that all scripture, all scripture is given, you know, for instruction and righteousness and training and different things like that. So that's really, really weak uh, as far as that goes. I think he also mentioned uh, that Tatian didn't like them. Well, Tatian was an ascetic um, and so he he thought that marriage itself was sinful. Well, Paul explicit, if I remember correctly, or at least he didn't get married and he was pretty strong about living like a non-sexual life whatsoever. Well, Paul condemns that. So you can see some reasons why he wouldn't like that. Um, but aside from that, there's interesting like undesigned coincidences uh, that are within um, the pastoral epistles. Uh, and what we have in Acts. Um, for example, um, 2 Timothy 1.5 talks about, uh, I brought it up earlier, how there was a faith that Tim, uh, Timothy inherited from his grandmother Lois and his mother uh, Eunice uh, that he says, I'm sure dwells within you as well. And then he also brings up, as I mentioned, that you know he was brought up with these sacred writings. Well, Timothy was steeped in these Jewish scriptures um, but it fits well with what we have in Acts. In Acts 16, 1 through 3, it says that Paul also came to Derby and then to Lystra, a disciple who was there named Timothy, a son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But it mentions that his father is a Greek, which is not mentioned in the pastoral epistles, which is interesting. And it says that he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Uh, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places, for they knew that his father was a Greek. And so in Acts, we learn that Timothy's father was Greek. But he apparently drew the line at circumcision. Uh, but his mother was a Jewish convert to Christianity. Uh, that's why he would have been familiar with the scriptures as a child. Second Timothy mentions his grandmother, but nothing about the father. Um, and neither group of details seems to be in connection with one another. And so I think that this kind of has like a ring of truth. Um, there are other undesigned coincidences between the pastoral epistles. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting in terms of uh, them not being a forgery is it just seems awfully strange. For a forger to bring up things like, hey, you know, bring my cloak, <laughs> bring my parchments, you know, um, different things like that. Um, it's just kind of an odd details, you know, it talks about like, hey, I hope to meet you up, meet up with you again here and there. There's all these like really subtle, kind of casual personal details and reminiscences that are in there. And it's just like, why is a forger bringing up something like, hey, Demas forsook me, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, again, like I said, bring, bring my parchments or um hey you know make sure to uh talk to Zenus the lawyer and Apollos and tell him such and such it's just like I, I don't know I think it just makes more sense that these are things that are actual reminiscences of Paul um and so I think when you look at some of the internal evidence as well as the external evidence that we have as we talked about earlier I, I just don't see a good reason to reject him um the differences that people like to highlight like theological differences are just bad. Um, again, I guess what I would just say, just watch my video because I, I cover the main objections. Um, and I think it was actually the pastoral epistles in studying this particular topic, because there's like supposedly this strong consensus that Paul didn't write them from scholarship that made me realize that scholarship maybe is probably a little bit on the bankrupt side. <laughs> it's because it's like, if these are kind of the arguments that they find to be very strong about attribution of authorship, uh, then 
it kind of opened my eyes to think, okay, a lot of the reasoning that they have maybe for other things might not be as good as well. And so we don't want to just take a scholar's word for it. We want to look into these things ourselves. Uh, let, me, let me just hop in real quick and say, for those who are interested, uh, you can find that video that Eric is speaking about uh, at youtube.com forward slash at testify apologetics. And it is, uh, I actually saw that the other day. It's excellently, excellently made. Um, which is really interesting because the person who asked the question had seen an argument on TikTok <laughs> about it's, that. It's yeah. probably that exact argument. Um, it, it's because Dan McClellan's everywhere. Um, and he's a smart guy. Um, and I think he's um, definitely knows scholarship really well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, definitely feel free to check out the video because he gives three reasons and I give three reasons. Um, citing a, a lot of New Testament scholars who may be giving a minority position, but I think their arguments just are a whole lot stronger and the, arguments are weak. So the, there, there are several unexplained allusions in the pastorals. Eric's already alluded to a few of them. There's um, another example is um, that uh, in 2 Timothy 1.15, uh, the author says, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagilus and Hermogenes, right? Now, that seems like a very peculiar allusion for a forger uh, mm -hmm. to invent without any further elaboration or explanation as to what he's talking about. Um, um, the, also, the, the ways in which uh, Onesiphorus uh, rendered service to Paul uh, in Ephesus is also left unexplained, um, although Paul indicates that Timothy knows of them in 2 Timothy 1, 16-18. Um, and the letter of Second Timothy is filled with uh, so many of these pointless personal touches and obscure references, including the cloak that Eric mentioned in chapter 4, verse 13, that he left at Troas uh, with Carpus, um, who's mentioned nowhere else in scripture. Um, the, the hypothesis that, that the pastorals represent a forgery seems to me to be exceedingly unlikely. I'd also argue that they stand or fall together, so any argument bearing on the authenticity of one also bears on the authenticity of all three. Um, there's also uh, undesigned coincidences, as um, Eric mentioned. So um, one example of that is uh, so in Acts 16 um, – I'm sorry, in um, – so here's one with with the Pauline with with other Pauline letters. So in Second Timothy four twenty, it says Erastus uh, remained at Corinth, and left Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. So Paul here mentions his, his solitude, and he urges Timothy, um, uh, "Do your best to come uh, before winter." And we know from um, Acts nineteen twenty two that Timothy and Erastus were two of his helpers, which means that Timothy and Erastus uh, evidently uh, knew each other well, um, and hence it is uh, fitting that Erastus should be mentioned in a letter to Timothy. And also, uh, it seems to be a fair uh, presumption that the city of Corinth was Erastus's home. That's why Paul mentions to Timothy that Erastus remained at Corinth. And so it's striking then that when we turn over to the book of Romans in chapter 16, verse 23, we read Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Um, and it turns out that um, Erastus was the city treasurer for, this, uh, for the city from which Paul was writing his epistles to the Romans. And um, it, it turns out that we can establish on independent grounds that the letter to the Romans was written from Corinth during the three month stint that Paul had in in Corinth that we read of in in Acts chapter nineteen or or Acts chapter twenty rather at the beginning of Acts chapter twenty in verse three and so um, that's that's an example of uh, an undesigned coincidence uh, it was actually confirmed by an archaeological discovery there was a pavement slab recovered from the ancient ruins of Corinth that mentions that Erastus bore the expense of this pavement and it seems quite plausible that this is the same guy um um, another example is in 2 Timothy 3, 10, 11, we read, um, you, whoever, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet for them all, the Lord rescued me. Um, so he's talking here about uh, Antioch and Pisidia, um, and we read in Acts 13 that Paul was sent there along with Barnabas. And um, so in, in Acts 13, 50 and 51, we read the Jews in sight of the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district, but they shook off the dust uh, from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And then Acts 14, the first seven verses tell us of the persecution 
the Paul endured in Iconium at the hands of both the, the Jews and Gentiles, which were occasioned by his preaching in the Jewish synagogue. And as a, as a consequence, Paul had to flee to Lystra and Derby, um, cities of um, Lyconia and the surrounding country, um, where they continued proclaiming the gospel. And then in Acts 14, we read um, of Paul being stoned and dragged out of the city by Jews, again from Antioch and Iconium. And so it's evident that uh, that account relates directly to the persecutions that Paul is referencing in 2 Timothy 3, 10, 11, where he alludes specifically to his persecutions and sufferings that happened to him at, Iconia, at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And so we have a, a conformity between Acts and 2 Timothy in terms of his persecutions in those three cities of Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And there's also a conformity of the fact that he suffered these persecutions in immediate succession and in the order in which Paul mentions the cities in his letter to Timothy. And uh, it's, um, it also seems it seems to imply in the text that we just read in 2 Timothy that Timothy had witnessed these persecutions that happened to him in these cities, or at the very least was very well acquainted with them and can bring them readily to mind. And that too also can be corroborated from Acts. So if you look at Acts, um, so Paul makes the second uh, missionary journey through through the same country, and then uh, the purpose of that trip in, in Acts 15.36 was to check on those who had been converted during the first journey to see how they were doing. Uh, and the first two verses of Acts 16, we learned that Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And so we see that Derby or Lystra was Timothy's hometown. And it's clear from the text that Timothy has already been converted by the time of that visit. Um, and Paul himself, in, in, in the pastoral letters, refers to Timothy as my true child in the faith and my beloved child in, in both First and Second Timothy. And so that indicates that Timothy was most likely Paul's own convert. And it follows that Timothy was almost certainly converted upon Paul's previous journey through these cities just at the time when the apostles had undergone uh, the, the persecutions that are alluded to him in the letter to Timothy. Um, and finally, um, what's uh, so that, that's just a couple of examples of undesigned coincidences, and there's more. Um, but um, one, one of the most popular arguments for, uh, for the pastoral letters being a for forgery is that um, the, the, the pastoral letters fit nowhere. They can't be integrated into the book of Acts. Um, and I, I actually think that that is an argument precisely in the opposite direction. First of all, it strengthens the case from these undesigned coincidences because it suggests strongly that these are actually independent. I mean, why have these minute correlations between um, Acts and the pastorals? And yet uh, it's very difficult to integrate um, the, the pastorals into the accounts we read in the book of Acts. Um, and so, so in, in, in real life, though, pe people do change their plans. So we can reconstruct from the prison epistles and pastorals how Paul revised his plans and carried them out between the two imprisonments, his first and second Roman imprisonment. And so rather than being an argument against the authenticity of the pastoral epistles, I would actually um, present it as, a, as an evidence confirming uh, their Pauline authorship. I know there's a lot more to say there. I have a, a 30 page essay, which is uh, published on my website on the authorship of the pastoral letters, uh, which uh, I commend to your reading. It's called uh, Who Wrote the Pastoral Epistles, The Case for Traditional Authorship. So if you want like a, a really uh, detailed discussion of this, where I interact with all the all the relevant scholarship, including extensive treatment of Bart Ehrman's book um, um, on, on uh, forgery and counterforgery, um, and also his popular level work, Forged, then uh, I, I refer you to that article. And again, that's jonathanmcclatchy.com for those of you who are interested in that. And uh, very, very quickly, I just want to change direction for a moment because I want to get Vlad involved here. Uh, we had a question directed to you. And let me see. Let me pull this up here. Okay. What sources, Vladimir, old or new, would you recommend for someone who's looking for a good criticism of Unitarianism or Socinianism? So what resources hmm. would you recommend for people who are looking uh, to kind of take apart those heresies? Well, if we're speaking of Socinianism uh, precisely, which is a heresy, as you said, which denies the fact that Christ himself is God, mm -hmm. uh, there are perhaps two books that um, aren't extremely complicated, but are very, very detailed in their presentation of the deity of Christ and also of the wider Trinitarian model. Uh, the first would be um, 
Putting Jesus in His Place by uh, Robert Bauman and Ed Komazewski. Uh, it is a very good book. It argues along the lines of uh, what they call, it's sort of a backronym, hands, uh, honors, attributes, names, deeds, and seat of God. Christ has the hands of God in that sense. And so it goes through the scriptures and uh, counters certain Socinian interpretations of particular texts, but also exegetes um, some of our own uh, preferred texts in dealing with the deity of Christ in a very powerful manner. And so that is a book I would wholeheartedly recommend. Another more recent one is um, Our God is Triune, and it is edited by uh, Michael Burgos, uh, if I remember correctly, and uh, Anthony Rogers, a very potent Trinitarian apologist, also wrote a, a few chapters in it. And it is a more uh, detailed exposition of general Trinitarian thought, uh, contrary to uh, various forms of Unitarianism, not just Socinianism. It goes into the Old Testament, exegetes passages about the angel of the Lord, um, about uh, general Trinitarian answers to um, Socinian arg argumentation and so forth. So it's a, it, those two are perhaps the most uh, important ones if, if one wants to get into more serious uh, argumentation on the topic. Another two things I would recommend, uh, since the author, I think, mentioned older sources as well, is there are a lot of uh, older articles um, on answering-islam.org written by the aforementioned gentleman, Anthony Rogers, and a few others. Uh, they're available for free, and they deal with a whole bunch of topics, Unitarian arguments presented by Muslims, uh, Socinians, uh, Arians, like Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. Uh, but if we want to go way back into um, kind of the beginnings of, of these discussions, uh, there are certain works that are very dear to my heart. Um, these deal more in detail with uh, a Sabellian type of Unitarianism, mm -hmm. a type of Unitarianism that doesn't um, necessarily argue that Jesus isn't God, rather it confuses the persons of the Trinity, and those are against Noetus and against Praxius by uh, Hippolytus and uh, Tertullian, respect, uh, respectfully, and they, they, they really uh, do a really good job uh, against uh, a sort of Sabellian uh, view of of uh, God. Um, they don't really address anything similar to Socinianism because that didn't exist, quite frankly, in the early church. The closest thing would be adoptionism, which believes that Christ at some point in his life, be it baptism, uh, resurrection, or transfiguration, became God, got assumed into God. Um, so there, there's nothing from the very early church about Socinianism, but perhaps Arianism would be uh, a candidate and that we can find, of course, the writings of uh, Athanasius against the Arians, which are also available for free online. Um, I would heartily recommend them. They do deal with a bit of history uh, of the church more broadly, um, history of the Arian controversy rather than specifically the doctrine, but they are very, very good as well. Jonathan, Eric, anything you would add? Uh, I recommend the same resources that Vladimir did. Uh, the book, uh, Our Goddess Triune, is, is an excellent resource uh, there. Um, I don't know if I have anything in particular to to add there. And uh, what about you, Eric? Uh, no, I don't think I. I think he hit the nail on the head. Um, he brings he mentioned Sabellianism, um, which is just kind of like your modern day one is. Pentecostalism, which is different. It's a different question. Um, but all of these things are interrelated in, in some way or another when you're coming to denying the twin Trinity. The Twinity, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, sounded like Tweety Bird there for a second. Anyway, um, but yeah, Oneness Pentecostals and the Trinity by Greg Boyd is, is an excellent resource on that topic as well. Um, and so I'd, I'd recommend that. But that's not, again, Arianism, that's... Um, the, the oneness modalism kind of view, um, which he actually came out of, um, interestingly enough, that's part of his background. And so, but he gets into a lot of the, the theology um, there that's, it's, it's uh, well worth reading. Uh, Vladimir, there was another question that came in for you. Um, I have read that Muslims believe Christ was the son of Mary was virgin born, and yet he was merely another apostle, uh, that they do not believe he was God incarnate. Is it because they cannot accept 
the idea of God as man, or is there some other reason they would deny Jesus' deity? And what is the best way to approach, in a college campus setting, Muslim friends who deny the deity of Jesus? Hmm. That is a very, very wide question. So firstly, why is it the case that a Muslim in general would deny the deity of Christ? Well, one might answer very simply and say, because the Quran does. The Quran poses questions such as, um, well, if Christ is God, how could he eat? Uh, if Christ is God, um, or if his uh, mother as well is uh, some sort of a deity, how could they perform certain bodily functions? It puts uh, being a man at contradiction with being God. And so, yes, that would be perhaps um, a way of, of reasoning as to why a Muslim can't generally grasp the idea that Christ is God, because to them, being a man is totally antithetical to being God. Uh, that simply, those two things cannot be brought together. Um, but more generally, it is simply because they do not believe in the same God we do. Um, Allah is a Unitarian God, and so uh, there is no concept of a multipersonal deity, which is why Christ um, is, is completely excluded from that sort of an idea. Now, the second part of the question is interesting. How best do we approach our Muslim friends um, and in a college campus sort of a way? Um, it really depends on the friend, right? It depends on how open your friend is to these sorts of discussions. Some people, especially some Muslims, uh, can be very easily offended when their faith is questioned, even get violent. So it, it, it really depends on the sort of character of your friend and how open he is to these ideas. Generally speaking, it helps to um, present what you believe. Uh, to the Muslim friend and see how engaged he is with that sort of an idea. See how, um, what his reaction is to your faith. Does he immediately go out to try and refute your faith? Is he passive about it, etc.? And from that, you might be able to judge um, the sort of way you might approach him. Uh, but the best way, I think, to approach a Muslim in general without those considerations uh, is to simply demonstrate the discontinuity between the Judeo-Christian stream of thought uh, and theology and that of the Quran and, and later Islam. Uh, there's just no, no real connection. There is no um, quotations, say, of the Old Testament or of Jewish or Christian traditions within the Quran. There's no following of them. Uh, there's some altered stories that Muhammad picked up along the way, of course, about Old Testament history and things like that. But there is really no continuation um, of, again, the Ju Judeo-Christian theology. There is some common terms like the idea of a Messiah or the idea of a prophet sent by God, idea of scriptures, etc. But they all take a completely different definition um, compared to those in the Judeo-Christian stream of thought. And so I would try to point out this sort of discontinuity. If it is really the same God, uh, that sent us down the, the um, as they call it, the Zabur and the Torah, the, the Psalms and the Torah and the Gospel, uh, then we would expect some sort of a continuation, and there simply is none. And that obviously gets into historical problems, like the fact that there are no Muslim disciples of Jesus. There is no mention of an Islamic Jesus anywhere within history, even though the Church Fathers painstakingly compiled things like Adversus Heresius, um, like compilations of refutations of early heresies, um, and things like that. So th there's none of that. There's no uh, Muslim versions of the gospel or Muslim versions of the Torah um, anywhere in history. There's uh, no idea about Christ not being crucified, apart from certain Gnostics who didn't believe he was a man and therefore couldn't be crucified. So uh, I, I would just point out these historical blunders and discontinuities and uh, see how the, the, the friend reacts. I think those are good to start with. And then obviously present the Christian message to him and see how wonderfully it is prophesied within the Old Testament. And of course, Jonathan kind of specializes in this, mm -hmm. in uh, how the Messiah uh, is, is shown in the Old Testament and how it translates into the New. So. Yes, Jonathan just posted an excellent article from Isaiah 53, uh, pointing mm. to Christ as the suffering servant. I would encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, Jonathan, Eric, anything you all would add to that? Uh, 
No, in particular, um, yeah, I, I agree with everything Vladimir said. Uh, I I think a major problem for Islam is the, the Quran in very many places, uh, scores and scores of places, claims to be a continuation of the previous scriptures, um, and uh, the, namely the the Torah and the Injil, uh, Injil being derivative from the Greek Evangelion, meaning gospel, and uh, not only claims to be a continuation thereof, but also appeals to Christians and Jews to judge the content of Muhammad's message by the content of their own scriptures that were revealed beforehand. Uh, and so it, it doesn't make sense unless, that doesn't make sense unless the Christians and Jews have access to the documents that the Quran is referring to. And, uh, and so that implies that, um, that the Bibles that the Christians and Jews were reading at the time of Muhammad, Muhammad lived between uh, 517 and 632, um, um, are in alignment with the teachings of Islam and, and Muhammad and so forth. Even insofar as, so according to Surah 7 verse 157 and Surah 61 6, uh, Muhammad apparently is predicted in both the Old and New Testaments, uh, in the Torah and the Injil. <laughs> and of course, the uh, Muslims had you know, 16 centuries. Um, um, or 14, uh, for, uh, for, sorry, 14, uh, had, um, uh, 14 centuries to search high and low for um, Muhammad in the Bible, and they've come up with a few texts that they um, that they might appeal to, such as um, um, it, Deuteronomy 18, which is a prophet like Moses, uh, and uh, there's a number of problems with that. Uh, it speaks about uh, the prophet that's to come from amongst their brethren, and mo Muslims typically understand that as referring to the Ishmaelites, and Muhammad was an Ishmaelite. And so, uh, uh, because Ishmael was a brother of Isaac, but the problem is that contextually, uh, um, brethren is used uh, exclusively in the terms of kinsmen or f fellow kinsmen. So in other words, from among your own people. Uh, Deuteronomy 14, 15, and 16, the paraclete passages in the New Testament is one of the other key proof texts, um, which where Jesus predicts the helper that's to come after him, which has traditionally been understood to be the Holy Spirit. And Muslims say, no, this is Muhammad. And there's a number of problems with that too. The most decisive one is that according to John 15 and John 16, uh, the paraclete is supposed to be sent by Jesus. Now, according to Islam, who sends prophets? Well, it's Allah who sends prophets. And so if we're saying the paraclete is Muhammad, and Muhammad, of course, is a prophet, and he's sent by Jesus, according to John 15 and John 16, who does that make, who does that make Jesus? And uh, it, makes him, it makes him Allah. Um, and so basically, you, in, in making that argument, you commit shirk, you ascribe partners to Allah, and uh, and therefore you're condemned to hell. So that that's problematic. Um, and as Vladimir said, the Quran explicitly uh, in Surah 4, verse 157 and 158 denies that Jesus was crucified. And that's, that's uh, highly problematic because there's overwhelming evidence Jesus was crucified historically. And Muslims will typically respond by saying, well, perhaps someone is made to look like Jesus and put on the cross in his stead. Uh, this is the classic interpretation of Surah 4 verse 157. The problem with that is that we have good evidence that Jesus predicted ahead of time his impending death and resurrection. Um, and so um, if that is the case, then one of two things is true. Either he was killed by crucifixion, in which case the Quran got it wrong, in which case Islam is false. Because according to Islam, Surah 85.22, the, the Quran is is actually the speech of Allah, and it's actually written in tablets uh, in classic Sunni thoughts from all eternity. And so that's a problem that you have the errors in the Quran. Um, and so um, so if, if Jesus wasn't crucified, then Islam must be uh, – sorry, if Jesus was crucified, Islam must be wrong. And if Jesus wasn't crucified, then that renders him a false prophet because he predicted ahead of time that he would be crucified uh, and killed. And so uh, – and if he's a false prophet, then Islam is also false because the Quran claims that he's a true prophet. So it's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of situation there. Um, so that, that's just the, the pinnacle of the iceberg. There's, there's a lot more there. Um, and I, I think that uh, the – continuity that exists between the new and old testaments as far as uh, the presentation of christ and the messiah and so forth and its fulfillment in jesus ministry death and resurrection i think that, that is an evidence for um christianity whereas the discontinuity that exists between judaism and christianity on the one hand and then islam on the other um, i think is a is an evidence that disconfirms the veracity of, of islam eric anything to add there <laughs> 
Um, not a whole lot. I think you guys hit the nail on the head for the most part, um, for sure. Um, the only thing I would say is just kind of ministering to these people. One of the reasons why I just kind of focus on the reliability of the gospel so much um, is because the positive evidence uh, evidence for it uh, just confirms a lot of things, <laughs> uh, including Islam. And so, and the positive evidence for the simple reportage view of the gospels, I think is just extremely strong. It disconfirms these alternate claims uh, that Muslims will have, because it seems like on one hand, they want to say that the Injil was part of the word of God, yet at the same time, they have to resort to the theories of biblical critics like Bart Ehrman and others, you know, that the gospel authors felt free to make things up or they contradict, you know, contradictions is a big one uh, with Muslims or they're embellishing different things um, and all of those other things. And the evidence against that hypothesis is overwhelming um, that that's what's going on. And also it's just odd uh, to me that they'll often cherry pick certain verses out of say the gospel of John and say, well, see this, this confirms Unitarianism or something like that. But then they completely overlook other verses from the gospel of John that point in the opposite direction. And so you can't just have like, well, these nuggets, we know these they're in line with the Quran, I guess. So therefore they're historically reliable. We want to argue against all this other stuff. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so, um, I guess I just find Muslim arguments to just often be incredibly weak. <laughs> and I would just recommend if you're looking to um, share your, the gospel with your Muslim friends, uh, just learn the positive case for the reliability of the gospels, because it just confirms a lot. Um, and it will help you not only with your Muslim friends, but your atheist friends, your Socinian friends, if there are any, you know, that we already kind of touched on. And so, um, yeah, that's still only thing I would really add. You know, being that we are a part of Talk About Doubts ministry, I think this might be a good opportunity. Uh, Eric, if you wouldn't mind, this is something I know you've spoken about, produced some videos uh, relating to, is the idea that um, before one engulfs themselves in all the information of the critics, mm -hmm. it may be good for a believer or a follower of Christ uh, to first engulf themselves uh, in the very good information that's out there and that is available to all believers that helps us have uh, a greater confidence in the biblical text. Would you care to speak about that just for a moment? Sure. Um, if you think about it, if the, the video that I base that on is um, uh, basically called something that uh, Tim McGrew uh, called Butler's Wager, um, which is basically kind of similar to Pascal's Wager, except for it doesn't fall into the problems that Pascal's Wager has, right? Pascal, you can't really just believe something voluntarily. And people might push back on me uh, on this. That's not what Pascal's Wager really is. Well, that's that's fine, but you're still going to run into these criticisms, okay? You can't just choose to believe something, even if you don't think that it's necessarily true. Um, and you can't just, um, yeah, so that's one of kind of the issues with Pascal's wager. There's also the issue of like, well, which which God do I pick, you know? Um, but with Christianity, there at least is some reason to look into it. Because the, 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 the claims of Christianity is that a tremendous miracle happened, uh, that it happened um, not, this the, the first reports of it were not from far, far away. Um, that they were not, um, the first reports of the resurrection wasn't, at a great distance of time, it wasn't a great distance of, of, of di you know, miles when these things were first reported. And they were reported in the teeth of, of persecution, okay? I mean, the, the leader of the movement itself was crucified. So it's not something that you should just, like, just dismiss casually. It's something that warrants serious investigation. And what I often see is that people who, just, you know, are, are too dismissive of Christianity, and you'll often find people trying to criticize Christianity without doing a very good job of like steel mailing, steel manning the actual argument for Christianity itself, um, which is, I, I would be out of a job if, if if skeptics could actually do that a little bit better, or at least I'd, I'd have a lot less material to work with, I'll put it that way. And I think they would make better criticisms at worst if they really took the time to do that. And so what I'm saying now, that's from an atheist perspective, but I'm saying from a Christian perspective, if this is possibly even true, then it does warrant serious investigation. 
And what I'm saying now is to wager like, hey, I'm just going to live and pretend I'm a Christian or whatever, because Pascal's wager, I'm saying no, take some serious time and investigate it, because there's not reasons to just dismiss it. And it's, ex it's an extremely important message. Okay. There is tons and tons and tons of things that can be said against Christianity because there's just a ton of interest in the subject. And one could very easily just completely overwhelm themselves with information of, of just all of these different objections. But if you don't have the, the positive evidence for the reliability of the Gospels or for the evidences for Christianity under your belt first, and you just try and go out there and go, I'm just going to expose myself to everything that you're going to open yourself up to all, all kinds of confusion and different things like that. And when people get mad at me, they're just saying, well, just seek out your confirmation bias and just <laughs> grab a hold of it and ignore everything else. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, get to the point where you can steel man the argument and the evidences for Christianity first, before you take on these other things, because then you're going to see a lot of the mistakes and the pitfalls that these atheists and these skeptics often point out. And you're going to be able to see through a lot of the things that are wrong. You'll be able to understand the, the argumentative landscape, you know, and, and what has been said about these things over the past 1500 years from the Christian side. And you're going to be less likely to be open to confusion, right? And so even an atheist, I think they would want to say, hey, um, maybe an atheist is like, hey, fellow atheist, please don't embarrass yourself and go out there and say that Jesus never existed. Well, I don't think that it would be wise for that fellow atheist to say, go listen to a bunch of lectures by Richard Carrier and spend a bunch of your time listening to mythicists on YouTube. Um, and then also read Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? There's just going to be this cacophony of voices that if they just would have read the positive evidence for the existence of Jesus first, they'd sit and listen to Carrier and go, that's stupid. That's, that's a bad argument. That doesn't work. That doesn't make sense. And, and they're not going to expose themselves of looking like a fool later, you know, for arguing with people online that Jesus didn't exist. Well, if you, that's just the risk there is not looking like a fool. Here, the risk is your, your own salvation, your own eternity, if that makes sense. And so maybe I'm not articulating it as clearly as I normally would. It's been a while since I made that video. But um yeah, that's just kind of the basic idea is if you understand the arguments for Christianity first, it's a whole lot easier to see through the holes. One of the things that when I was just learning about apologetics is Tim McGrew just gave me like a giant book and we can link this in the show notes or whatever, offer it to people in the discord server, or whatever, who are interested. Um, but he just gave me a bunch of books arguing for the positive case for, for um, Christianity and, and what people have said in response to some of the arguments against it. And it, it did include a few skeptical voices as well. But once I got that under my belt, I turn on YouTube and I watch these guys give me their spiel. And it's like, okay, I'm just thinking of like 10 things that easily I can see where you've, mm -hmm. you, you've gotten wrong. But if somebody's not familiar with that, they're going to get really confused. They're going to get really bogged down and they could even get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't, why overwhelm and tax yourself? When you don't even know the strongest arguments for what you believe in the first place or or does that make sense yes that, yeah. absolutely absolutely uh jonathan let me uh let me direct this question to you quickly because i believe it 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 is along the same line of thinking uh for dr mcclatchy on february 11th the north american mission board tweeted the following quote 40% of U.S. adults believe the Bible has been disproven by science, unquote. Uh, Dr. McClatchy, as a scientist, what is it that leads you to believe the Bible to be God's word? And what can the average layperson do to be better equipped in reaching skeptical friends who believe the Bible and science are in opposition? So that questions kind of go along with what Eric was just talking about. Yeah, great question. Um, I would be interested to know what aspect of the biblical text uh, the questioner wonders if it's been disproven by science. Um, and, I mean, the Bible is a big book, and uh, not all hypothesized errors in scripture carry uh, equivalent epistemic weight, right? There are, there are some things that would be of less epistemic consequence, even if a valid objection, than others. Um I, I mean, I'm persuaded that scientific evidence is very heavily 
uh, supportive of the proposition of theism. I think that theism is just overwhelmingly, uh, spectacularly even supported by by the scientific evidence, uh, in particular in my own discipline of uh, biology, uh, where we see that uh, biology is chock full of digitally encoded uh, information content that run runs along the spine of the DNA molecule. And uh, the, alpha the, the chemical subunits that we represent as the alphabetic characters A, C, T, and G determine how a, a, um, a, um, end up specifying the sequence of amino acids that make up a protein um, and the the precise properties of the side chains of those amino acids in turn determines how the protein will collapse into its uh, three-dimensional structure um and so uh, in, in every other realm of experience when you find information content uh it, um, especially in a digital form we habitually associate that with conscious deliberation or intelligent agency uh because it takes foresight to bring about intelligence or uh, sorry, inf information or information rich systems and uh and we also see in the cell um nano machines that are irreducibly complex that is to say that they have a higher level of objective that's accomplished with multiple sub functions that have to work together in unison to bring about this higher level objective and if you were to remove any one of the components then you don't have a system that works half as well as it used to or quite as well as it used to but it's broken and uh, that, again, points to a cause that has foresight, and that is going to be indistinguishable from intelligence. There's also evidence um, of the prior fitness of nature for, um, for life to exist, in particular advanced life. Um, so one example of that is that the... Um, so the, the, the non-metal atoms in the periodic table, and namely car um, specifically carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen make up the material substances of the cell and these are essentially the only atoms that you could use uh, to build uh, a biochemical system uh, and the reason for that is that they make a uh, strong stable directional uh, chemical bonds and it's and critically it's these covalent bonds that give molecules with shape and it's shape that's the essence of uh, biochemistry and these atoms have an electronegativity such that the attraction of electrons for hydrogen and carbon is very similar. And this means that uh, you generate by putting a carbon and hydrogen together nonpolar molecules, uh, which means uh, that the, uh, the electrons are, are, are shared equally between the, uh, the atoms. So uh, carbon and hydrogen have a similar value of electronegativity or, or how strongly uh, atoms pull electrons towards the nucleus. And so that means that they are able to, to share uh, electrons, uh, creating a, a covalent bond. And since carbon and hydrogen have a similar electronegativity, the electrons are shared equally and the, the bond is, is called nonpolar. But if you put oxygen and hydrogen together, you get a polar molecule, uh, meaning that uh, there, it's the, the electrons are unequally shared. And that's critical to the whole organization of the cell because it gives you hydrophobic force and it's a hydrophobic force that organizes the higher level structure of the, the biological realm. Um, it's the, the hydrophobic force that assembles membranes and proteins. Uh, the the non-polar uh, side chains, which are the, the hydrophobic um, side chains are tucked away inside um, and form an aggregate inside the protein structure, whereas the polar or hydrophilic amino acid side chains face the exterior of the protein. And that's crucial for, um, for forming uh, protein structures. And hydrophobic force is also um, essential for forming the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So the argument for design then is that the very atoms that give you the stable, stable defined shapes from which you can build macromolecules also give you the hydrophobic force, which is the key to assembling them into high three-dimensional forms. So that's a really striking coincidence that I think points to teleology or design. Um, and so there, there's tons of, of um, coincidences like that, which cumulatively, I think, point to uh, design as being uh, the best explanation um, uh, over, over any alternative. Um, and, uh, for, for more discussion of that, I refer um, listeners to... Uh, Michael Denton's books, uh, um, you can read about that particular one, along with many other um, such coincidences relating to the periodic table of elements uh, in The Miracle of the Cell, in particular, by Michael Denton. I'd also refer reader, uh, listeners to um, uh, Stephen Meyer's book, Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Now, in terms of the Bible itself and why I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian primarily because I think that there's really good evidence for uh, the resurrection of Jesus.
um, from um, and uh, I, I am a defender of the maximal data approach to the resurrection that we've talked about at length before. I also um, would argue for the trilemma argument that was uh, this is most famously associated with C.S. Lewis, uh, the argument for messianic prophecy, the conversion of the apostle Paul, um, the, um, the, the argument from contemporary miracles, the argument from the survival of the nation of Israel against all odds and so forth. These cumulatively um, point, I think, very powerfully in the direction of Christianity being true. Um, I, I, so I um, if I, I I do think that science poses challenges to certain um, certain perspectives within Christendom, such as a uh, young earth creationism, for example, I think is problematic uh, from a scientific perspective. Um, and there's there's a whole lot of evidence I think against a young earth um, model. Uh, but I, I I do think that Genesis commits you to a young earth model. Uh, the first verse uh, the, the the first day of creation week I think it actually begins not in verse one. Of Genesis one, rather it begins in verse three of Genesis one, which is the first occurrence of the phrase "and God said." And um, and so by the time you even get to the first day of creation week, you already have the heavens and the earth created. And uh, I, as for um, what I think of the days of creation, the view that I take is um, most aligned with that of C. John Collins, uh, who's a Hebrew scholar, partially actually part of our talk about doubts team, and he takes the analogical days view, which is uh, to say that the days of creation are not identical to our regular solar days. Rather, they're analogous to the human rhythm of work and rest. So just as man has his six days that he labors in the Sabbath day of rest, so likewise God has his um, six days that he labored in the Sabbath day of rest in creation. Um, and I, I think that there's good, I, I affirm an historical Adam and Eve, and I don't think there's any problem with taking Adam and Eve literally. So I, I, don't, I don't really see any significant scientific challenges to biblical <clears throat> faith, and actually some strong evidence that supports theism, which is consistent with biblical faith, and uh, and also good historiographical evidence um, for the truth of Christianity in particular. Jonathan, I would I would just supplement um, the resources that you spoke of, and I would mention as well uh, Stephen C. Meyer's signature in the cell is mm -hmm. very good. Uh, and by the way, uh, C. John Collins has written a little book, Genesis one through four, uh, that is excellent and uh, it's really accessible and deals with Genesis one through four. So that would encourage folks to pick that up as well. Uh, we've got a, a little over an hour now. Uh, but I have two more questions that I really want to get to. Mm -hmm. um, both of these questions have to do uh, somewhat with the problem of evil. And uh, the, we'll just go ahead and get to the first question. And it regards the second coming of Christ and the delay of the second coming of Christ. And the questioner says, uh, everyone tries to give a rational answer like 2,000 years is not that long a time or God wants to save more souls. What really is the truth about this prophecy of the second coming of Jesus? But with all of the suffering throughout history, why make a promise that all things will be new someday and continue to basically delay the promise? Uh, so um, basically the question is, why the delay of the promise of the second return of the second coming of Christ? Just throw that for anyone who wants to jump. Vlad, you look like you would love to answer that question. So we'll go to you first. <laughs> well, that's an extremely complicated question. Uh, I, I, there's a funny joke about it. You know, um, it's even made in in, in the uh, Chosen series. And, and it's playing on the word soon. I am coming soon. Well, uh, the, the, don't use the word soon. We, we know how long that takes. Um, generally speaking, uh, I'm not entirely convinced in the idea that the early followers of Christ anticipated some sort of an immediate uh, coming of Christ soon um, within their lives or after. I do not find those arguments entirely persuasive uh, personally, but the question then becomes, okay, why is it the case that God would throughout history delay, as the questioner says, or rather not at a sooner point, um, instantiate the coming of Christ? And uh, the questioner mentioned a few points that I think are really good. One would be the idea that God simply wants to see as many people uh, as possible uh, within the kingdom of God. He wants to allow many people to be born, the gospel to be spread throughout the whole world, and uh, for the Christian message to 
change the world. Uh, the idea of Christianity is to, in a sense, establish the kingdom of God on earth. The, the kingdom of God is his church. And so uh, if it is the case that the church um, takes control of the world, people become partakers of the life of the church, uh, then this is a, an extreme moral good. And I think it is an entirely good thing for God to postpone or delay uh, the coming of Christ and the wrapping up of history, if we might call it that way, for that good. Yes, it's completely correct that due to the human nature and due to the way things are, many evil things will be committed uh, in this period of time before Christ comes. Uh, horrible things will happen. Many people will be lost. Many people will not know Christ. Uh, but it is entirely possible, and I think proper to believe, uh, that one of the reasons why Christ is not coming is because he wants people, more people, to come to know him. Um, another thing uh, that might be mentioned uh, in, in, in this regard is uh, also mentioned by the questioner, and that is the sort of, um, th this would be a part of the paradigm that certain um, scholars might present. I, I think Calvin Planting goes a bit into this uh, from the top of my memory. And that has to do with um, the general understanding that people develop through their knowledge of history and through their life on earth outside of the theosis, outside of glorification that we will experience in heaven. What do I mean by this? Well, because we get to experience all sorts of evils in the world, both those that have happened in our own lives, those that we have committed, and those that we have seen, heard from others, seen from history, we get to understand how life is without God. We get to understand what happens when we let our own human nature um, take control of the wheel, so to speak. And so um, if it is the case that we can allow uh, many people to live out these lives and learn from these lives how it is to, let's say, experience life, experience existence without being in full communion with God, um, even if we have freedom, which I do believe we will have, uh, freedom of, 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 of the mind and of the will within a glorified state, we will be so perfected and united with God and, and have a knowledge of um, the past actions that have uh, occurred while we were not united with God, that uh, they will be extremely useful in us not rebelling in any sense. Again, uh, we will not simply be made um, impotent creatures that have no freedom of the will within heaven. Uh, we, we will simply be perfected. And part of that perfection, I believe, comes from the fact that we will understand and have a full appreciation for the evil that has happened due to the actions of us and our fellow men within the world. So I believe God has very, very good reasons for allowing these things to take place, for allowing a longer period of time between his first and second coming. And the chief end of that is the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, which is his church, and also the... Um, sanctification and glorification of men that will ultimately happen at his second coming. Excellent. That was an excellent answer. Uh, Eric, Jonathan, anything you all would like to add to that? Eric, do you want to go first? I, I, I could ask um, about certain texts. But... Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's a lot of different directions you could go with this. And so um, I don't necessarily think sometimes people will say well jesus predicted his coming and it was supposed to happen in the first century um well i mean he talks about the great tribulation being something that um will be like one of the worst events in history nor ever will be so the very term nor ever will be indicates that some sort of earthly history was going to continue after that um there is like this constant mentioning of um you know the kingdom the lord being near and the lord being at hand and yet there's these constant things being thrown out there like be patient um different things like that it seems like there was an expectation of some kind of delay the fact that jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a mustard seed well that's something that starts off very small and grows over a long period of time 
he talks about the kingdom of God being like a little bit of leaven that slowly leavens the entire lump. He talks about there will be a period of time where uh, the tares are going to grow along with the wheat. Um, he talks about there being a delay with 10 virgins and five being ready and five not and the, the, the master coming at a time where they didn't really expect and far later than they expected. And so I think it makes more sense to say that one person, Jesus is the only parable teller that we have in uh, the New Testament. When we don't see parables in the letters of Paul, we don't see parables really in, in the church fathers. Um, you, you can maybe make a case, I suppose, for the shepherd of Hermas a little bit, but not really. I wouldn't think so. Um, and so it makes sense to me. It's more simple that there was one master kind of parable teller because these all kind of fit with the personality and what we know about Jesus. Um, and I think they all indicate certain things like that, that the delay is something that he's almost going to judge us by in related to how we respond to the delay. Um, and so when he separates the sheep and the goats, uh, he talks about the people who cared for the sick and the the poor and um, the the imprisoned and different things like that. Um, these are character forming traits in us uh, to have this kind of readiness. Um, he gets upset with the one man who he gave a talent to uh, and just buried his talent into the ground. Whereas people who are using their talents, using the, the whatever God has given them to build the kingdom of God, he, he commended them. Um, and so I think that in terms of like the exegetical case that Jesus was expected to come in this first century just doesn't work. And I know that's not directly the question, but it sort of touches on that. Um, and there's there's a lot we could get into, and that would be a different conversation. But I think, as Vladimir alluded to, I think there's good reasons. And it's it's character building to have a readiness and to live with an expectation that it can happen in your lifetime. Um and that he he does forecast some kind of delay and some sort of slow spread. And this slow spread that he mentions with the kingdom is fully in line with what we see prophesied in Isaiah about a servant who would be rejected um, by his own nation, um, but yet would be a light to all nations. Um, and when Jesus says that this gospel must be preached unto all nations, uh, first, um, it, it's, it would seem to be that that is going to take some time, right? And that this gospel being preached so that more people can repent, you know, they seem to think that that was a bad answer. I don't think that's necessarily a bad answer, that more nations, that more people have an opportunity to hear the gospel is is a great good um, and to be able to have that opportunity to respond. And it also, it, it must be the case that it has to take place that for the prophecy to be fulfilled that... Mm -hmm this messiah should be rejected and uh, but eventually be that light to all nations and that this one descendant of israel uh this this tiny minuscule nation <laughs> um would spread belief in the god of israel um to a, a widespread group and who else could that be but jesus and so um for those reasons i you know i i kind of i understand i sympathize uh with it but i, I also see good in even my own life of how I am to prepare how I am to live ready um, as if he could come tomorrow um, because that, that creates in me a, um, an urgency to build the kingdom of God, to reorient my life in, in a proper way. And if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I understand because he's, he's looking to give more people those opportunities to respond and to, to live accordingly as well. Yeah. Jonathan, anything you'd like to add? Um, I could go through the texts. There's uh, three texts in the Gospels that are often used uh, to um, support the idea that Jesus uh, predicted he would come during the generation of his followers. Uh, it would take me a few minutes to go through that, though, and we did talk about it in the last Q&A panel. D did you have another question you wanted to get to? Or yeah, Yes, there, there, was, there was one other question that also dealt with the, the problem of suffering, the problem of evil in the world. And that other question... Um, I've tried to, to reword this a little bit here to be to be gentle with the questioner, um, but they have asked, having experienced abuse, it is very difficult for me to accept that there is an all-powerful God who did not stop 
the abuser. How can I accept the idea of a God who, according to the Bible, loves me but did nothing to help me when I needed him most? And and let me just preface before anyone jumps in to answer. Um, none of us can give just a quick pad answer to a question like that, but but maybe collectively you gentlemen can talk a little bit about um, the problem of evil and suffering. Jonathan, would you like to jump in? Sure. So um, as uh, Pastor Joey said, um, there's there, we can't give a specific explanation for any particular instance of, of suffering or evil in the world. And um, there, there's a, there is a distinction to be drawn between the emotional problem of suffering and the the intellectual or rational problem of suffering and these require a different approach uh the emotional problem uh requires more of a pastoral approach than than a philosophical approach and um yeah i i my heart goes out to you um if you've suffered uh abuse in that way um i'm, I'm really i'm sorry to to hear about that and that that's really really difficult um as for um why god permits the evil and suffering uh, to exist in this world the biblical perspective is that god um brings a greater good out of the suffering and evil that he allows in this world and that even if we don't understand or see what that greater good is in this life we it, it will make sense in the next life and we have good reason to think that God is good and that he's just. And so we can have, uh, we, we have a, a basis on which to trust uh, God, even when we don't understand why he allows certain things to, to happen uh, in our lives. Um, and, and so I, I'd refer you to the, the evidences for Christianity, such as the case for the resurrection and so forth. Um, which, although it doesn't explain why God permits uh, suffering in the world, and much less a particular instance of suffering in the world, it does give us a justification to, to trust him that he has some uh, greater good um, and justification, even if we don't know what that is. Um, anything to add there, Eric or Vlad or, or Joey also, since uh, you're a pastor, so you might have be able to speak more effectively into this. Um, anyone else have any thoughts? Um, I mean, I was, I grew up in not a great situation. I mean, I, I, I don't like comparing suffering because sometimes I feel like that could be minimizing and I definitely am not trying to do that. Um, but I'll share a tiny bit about my story that both, both of my parents were alcoholics that I was mostly left on my own as a child, um, that some of the times uh, my father could be somewhat abusive, um, in some ways, which we've since forgiven each other and everything is good now and he's no longer an alcoholic thank god um and so um so i i, I can understand because that's one of the reasons why as a teenager i became an atheist um i looked around at my my own brokenness in my own home i looked at the friends that i had who were coming from similar situations and i think that's probably why we were friends is usually people tend to kind of commiserate together and get in trouble together um, because you're not having that supervision and different things like that. And so um, there was a giant flood that took place in my hometown of St. Louis around that time. My mother got cancer and all of these different things. And that's one of the reasons why I became an atheist. And I think if there was at least a somewhat understandable reason, suffering would probably be it. Um, when you talk about these things from an intellectual standpoint, it could just feel kind of cold. Mm -hmm. um, and it can just feel kind of dead. But for me, I think ultimately why I even became open to there being uh, the possibility that God exists is, is if there is a God, he knows better than I do. Um, there's, there's a reason that I would not be in a strong position to say why he's necessarily and i don't want to push skeptical theism too hard here but i wouldn't be in a very strong position to say why he allows the type and the quantity of evils that we see um and, and i had to at least admit to myself that there has to be at least a few good reasons why he permits some evil and if if i have to say that there's at least some good instances where he does allow evil then how am i to say that the other instances that he has allowed are just not okay um 
And so it, it kind of puts me in a position, at least for me, I just had to put myself in a position to say, I don't really fully understand. But if he did become flesh, if if he did endure rejection, if he did endure physical suffering and physical abuse and pain, he didn't just stand off idly by, but he showed some sort of solidarity in the suffering that he allowed by allowing himself to go through it. And I think that's one thing that Christianity has going for it that no other theistic worldview has is that the creator himself entered into the creation and endured rejection from his own family, uh, mocking, beating, betrayal from his own personal disciples, um, uh, you know, being turned over by one of your own closest followers mm -hmm. to be ripped apart to shreds by a whip and to be mocked by Roman soldiers and flogged and have a crown of thorns twisted on your head and then nailed to a cross um, and, and be asphyxiated and just suffer a horrible, horrible death out of the promise of giving us eternal life and extending our life for forever and forgiving our sins, including the sins of the person who offended us mm -hmm. so that we could learn to, in our pain, learn to forgive them, which is a good, great good. In my own life, learning to forgive my own father for the abuse and the neglect and the, you know, all of the different things, which he is sorry for, you know, um, even though I wish I never had to go through it. And I don't, I don't even necessarily know if I would blame God for it necessarily directly, but he did allow it. Um, it, it has brought out good in my life. And, and in, if that can happen in my own life, in my own lifetime, it's possible that evils that I don't understand good can be brought out of that either in this life or in the life to come. And so I think that's how I wrestle with the emotional side of it, at least is, and the, and the, you know, the, the logical side of it, the, you know, whatever you want to say, the analytical side of it is that God became incarnate and suffered in infinitely ways worse than I did um, at the hands of people, um, the people that he created himself <laughs> uh, that had turned against him um, and forgave them all. Um, and so you just have to kind of keep your sights on Jesus and the heart of the gospel at that point. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy, um, but good can come out of it if you hold on. Vlad, anything you would like to add? I think both John and Eric did a tremendous job. Um, to me, I often like to uh, give sorts of uh, theodicies, so to speak, uh, as to why God might allow a specific evil or um, what good might come out of it in a bit more detail than Eric mentioned. But the problem here is, as Jonathan mentioned, is it's very difficult when you're dealing with a sort of emotional response to the problem of evil. Because if I was to say, okay, um, person X, here is what uh, good could have come out of that abuse. Uh, it, it can tend to be almost uh, unemotional. It, it can be uh, even insulting to that person. Oh, you think that this... Uh, something that you propose right now, you, you think that justifies what I went through? You have no idea what I went through. And so I tend to refrain from that. I would like to do that. Uh, but without knowing the specifics of the situation, without knowing the person, again, how the person might react, um, it is very, very difficult to answer that. And as Jonathan or Eric mentioned, it is a pastoral issue. I would honestly recommend somebody who is close to the person who is a good um, Christian, even a pastor, to walk them through it and to to, to kind of um, somebody who is familiar with the situation to to try to explain uh, why it is the case that God might have allowed that. It is far easier, I think, and more appropriate than for someone like us. Um, we can offer answers in a very general manner, uh, more specifically on the intellectual side as to why God might allow evil within the world. And we have done that on various occasions. But when it comes to specific things, it tends to be much harder. Oh, just to 
to add to what has been said uh, from a pastoral perspective uh, over 20 years of pastoral ministry it has been my experience when people have come to me with situations like this that um, just the quick answers of well there will be justice in the end you know you hear these types of answers and they can often agitate an individual and uh, Eric I think you and Jonathan both commented on that I think those types of answers can come across very cold. What, what I've personally found is that it's really helpful and beneficial to begin uh, by building a relationship on love, compassion, and understanding, allowing the person the room to say, I have been hurt. It was wrong. I don't want to forgive them right now. <laughs> uh, and, and to acknowledge the injustice and the suffering that they've gone through. And then, it, again, it has just been my experience from a pastoral perspective that over time, uh, people gradually become more open after they learn to trust you, as Vlad pointed out, a close friend, as they learn to trust you, uh, that they become more open to the idea that what sets Christianity apart is that our God became man and that he entered this world filled with suffering. And he suffered as well, and therefore he can understand uh, better than any other deity in all of, of human religious history exactly what we are going through. And not only did he come, not only did he suffer, not only does he understand, but he also brought redemption, uh, not only eternally, but he brought redemption to us in the here and now, that there is healing, there's compassion, there's forgiveness, there's love that we can experience, receive from him and then uh, be transformed by him to express that same kind of love and compassion and forgiveness for others. So I think it's more of a, this is a long game. This is not something I don't think we can, uh, as, as all three of you have pointed out, that we can answer very quickly on a panel discussion like this. But uh, um, anything else from you guys before we close up shop? Anyone like to add anything? I think you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. There's a parable uh, called the long silence. Let me see if we can find it. Um, that I think uh, is of value here. Um, and I, I got this originally from John Stott's book, The Cross of Christ. And here's the parable. At the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them, but some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped a parrot brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. In another group, a Negro lowered his collar. What about this? He demanded, showing an ugly rope burn, lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes. Why should I suffer? She murmured. It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plain, there were hundreds of such groups, each with a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he permitted in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear or hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader. Chosen because he had suffered most, a Jew, a Negro, a person from Iran, horribly deformed, arthritic, a thalidomide child. In the center of the plane, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. And when the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. No one moved. For suddenly, all knew that God had already served his sentence. Hmm. That was beautiful. That was wonderful. That, that, that's an excellent place to land the plane. <laughs>
I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, we do want to thank Jonathan, Eric, and Vlad today. And also, again, just a, a quick reminder, uh, if you have questions, you can log on to talkaboutdoubts.com, and there is a an easily accessible forum on there where you can um, where you can submit your question regarding to whatever doubt it may be that you're facing. And uh, Jonathan, our fearless leader, will connect you with scholars who can help you uh, in whatever area that you may be struggling with. Uh, also, we want to thank Vladimir for joining us today. And again, you can check out his YouTube channel at Vlad Apologist. So, and uh, also Eric Manning, I want to encourage you to check out his YouTube channel, Testify, uh, and his website, Is Jesus Alive? And again, you can learn more about Dr. McClatchy from jonathanmcclatchy.com. Uh, gentlemen, any closing remarks before we close up shop? Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, John. Um, one thing that I might recommend to some of our viewers that I find really uh, interesting, it's a very short three and a half minute video. It's called Felix Culpa. Um, it's made uh, in association with Dr. Oliver Plantinga. And it kind of represents uh, just one of many uh, reasons as to why God might allow evil. And the short of it is, in a single sentence, uh, the incarnation and the atonement are such great goods uh, that have come out of the fall of man uh, and the theology and the life associated with them uh, that uh, they construe any world where they are in, they construe a best possible state of affairs. This is a very simplified view of it, but there is a beautiful animated video to be had on the thought. And I think, especially with what you and others mentioned here about uh, Christ co-suffering with us, uh, experiencing the dreads of, of human life uh, in certain aspects, I would certainly recommend the video because it really ties into that. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, thanks all for tuning in. All right. Thanks, everyone.